Hello, calculus people. Welcome to our Friday lecture, where we're just going to take a quick little peek at how to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus, part uno and part doso. I don't think that's actually Spanish. But anyway, let's pop over to the statement of the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, and we can kind of break that statement down into a couple different pieces. So the first piece is that we're going to assume that the function f that we're working with is continuous on the function, uh, sorry, on the interval from a to b, so that's a closed interval. And then what we're going to do is we're going to define a new function uh, called g. And g is an integral function that's going to begin at x is equal to a and kind of scroll up to some unknown um, unknown number here, x, uh, and it's going to be the antiderivative essentially of the f function. And what we want to do is we'd like to show that g is not only continuous and differentiable, but we'd also like to show that the derivative of g is actually f of x, right? So this idea that taking the derivative of the antiderivative gives us back that original function. Now, there's three different things we have to show, but we're going to try to kind of kill three birds with one stone, so to speak. Um, notice that kind of these last two pieces kind of feel the same. So proving that g is differentiable and showing that its derivative is equal to f of x. So we're really going to be focusing on this last one. If we can show that the derivative is actually equal to f of x, then we pretty much have the other two for free. We know that g is differentiable, obviously, on the open interval, because we don't want to take the derivative at these endpoints. And the, uh, differentiability also is going to imply that g is going to be continuous. Uh, on the closed interval. So we're really just going to be focusing on that last little um, piece here that we need to show, and the other two come along for the ride. We get the other two for free. So the proof goes something a little bit like this. Um, we want to think about what it means for a function to be differentiable. So how could we calculate g prime uh, of x? So this is something that we've done before. Uh, in derivative calculus, we know that the derivative is equivalent to the limit as h tends towards 0 of uh, g at x plus h minus g of x all over h. So this is the limit definition of the derivative. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull this bit out and we're going to work with just the difference quotient because I want to kind of simplify this difference quotient and see what it looks like in terms of the function f. Okay, so what does this look like in terms of the function f? So what you're going to see me do as a first step in the proof is we're going to consider that difference quotient. And we're going to utilize this equation up here that we have for g. So we're going to utilize that equation to make some substitutions into this difference quotient and try to get this difference quotient in terms of this integral function instead. Okay, so g at x plus h could be written as the integral from a to x plus h of our f function. And we already know what g of x looks like. That's the integral from a to x of our f function. And all of this is still divided by h. Okay, so next what I'm going to do, just to kind of make our lives a little bit easier with some of the fractions here, is we're going to pull out that 1 over h, and we're going to just kind of write everything else uh, as a, a single line here, just, uh, just kind of pain in the butt to deal with this fraction. So just give me a second here to do that. Okay, and then it looks like what we're going to do is we're going to apply some properties of integrals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this piece right here and I'm going to break this apart into two uh, integrals using one of our integral properties.
Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start at A, we're gonna go up to X. And then we're gonna add to that starting at X and going up to H. All right, so here we're assuming that H is a small positive number so that I can go from A to X and then up from X to H. Um, and, and that should be okay. So this is, uh, we can do this because of one of our integral properties. Uh, uh, essentially taking the full area and breaking it up into two pieces. Okay, and we still have this last little bit left over, this a to x bit. Okay, and now something super nice has happened uh, because we have this uh, area here and we have its opposite over here. So these two areas effectively are going to cancel and give us zero. And so the difference quotient for g actually simplifies to 1 over h integral from x to h of our f function. Okay, so we're just going to kind of hold on to that um, for, for a moment and, and kind of now start working a little bit with something else. So that's kind of the, the first step is to just simplify that difference quotient. And so just hold on to this. Okay, so uh, that's just simplifying g a little bit. The next thing we want to do is actually use our assumption to do a little bit of work. So one of our assumptions is that f is a continuous function. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply the extreme value theorem to f on the particular interval that we're working on. Um, and the extreme value theorem essentially says that f has to attain some kind of maximal y value and some kind of minimal y value on this interval because f is continuous. Okay, so like I said, the extreme value theorem essentially says that the function on the interval that we're going to be applying this on has to attain a maximal y and a minimal y. So we just want to maybe assign some letters to this. Let's call the maximal y value capital M and the minimal y value little m um, or smaller or lowercase m like we were doing for our integral properties. Okay, so again, we're gonna kind of roll with some of the properties that we know. We know that now that we have a maximal y value and a minimal y value, we should be able to uh, bound the area of this function on this interval x to x plus h. Uh, and I should say probably like the area uh, and it's really truly going to be the net area, I would say. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to bound the net area between f. So the net area of f looks something like this on the interval that we're working on. Okay, so that's our. Uh, that's our net 
area for f uh, between the function and the x-axis between x to x plus h. And this net area can be bounded above by some kind of, uh, essentially some kind of bounding rectangle. And that large rectangle is given as m times the upper bound minus the lower bound. So the upper bound minus the lower bound. And once again, there's a, a lower uh, end of the spectrum as well. So the area, the net area between the x-axis and f can also be bounded below by a small rectangle. And that small rectangle is the minimal y value times b minus a, the upper bound minus the lower bound. So this is all, uh, we're essentially taking this inequality. Um, this is part of one of our integral properties and if we simplify uh, these uh, parentheses, what's inside the parentheses here, we're going to see that this ends up turning into little m times h should be less than or equal to our integral. And our upper rectangle has area m, uh, capital M times h. And what we're going to do is we're just going to divide all three of these by h so that we have the inequality m is less than or equal to 1 over h of our integral. And which must be less than or equal to capital M. So here is a nice uh, like bound, what we call a, like a bounding formula for the area. Um, and what we're going to do is we kind of notice that this looks like something that we have uh, up top. Did I do something? incorrectly here. I feel like I might have done something. Oh, I see. Can you make a, just a small little adjustment here? This upper bound right here actually should be x plus h, okay, not h. So we're just going to go ahead. We're going to fix that up here. So this should be x plus h, and this has to get fixed right here as well, okay? So this upper bound should be x plus h. Um, because what I want to do now is I want to kind of take this idea that I have this is actually equivalent to our difference quotient, um, and we should be able to apply some, some limits to, to this now, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to note that, you know, this down here looks like the difference quotient for g. So if I apply the limit as h goes towards 0 of this thing, that's really g prime. So that's our next step, is to apply the limit as h tends towards 0 to all three of the pieces in our inequality. Okay, this comes, this is kind of the tricky part here is kind of thinking about what happens to the maximal and minimal values as h tends towards zero. And the easiest way to kind of motivate what happens here is to draw a little picture. So I'm going to do that over here on the side. So um, let's assume that we're working inside the interval um, from, let's say, x to x plus h. And we have some kind of function in here. And of course, our function attains some kind of maximal y value. This is called capital M. And our function has some kind of minimal value. Okay, so little m and capital M are a result of f being a continuous function inside this little interval. And now what we want to do is we want to think about how do little m and uh, capital M change as h tends towards zero. So essentially what we have is we have this x value is going to start sliding this way 
as h gets smaller. So as h gets smaller, that right hand point kind of starts to crunch over towards the x value. Um, and eventually what's going to happen is that both our max and min are going to land exactly right here at this green point as h gets closer and closer to zero. So our maximal y value and minimal y value essentially kind of get crunched to this particular y value, which is called f of x. Okay, so that's what's happening kind of visually. So what's happening, now we're going to return back to that inequality. The limit of our minimal y value tends towards f of x. We know that this inside piece here, this is really just the derivative of g because this is the limit of the difference quotient of g. And then for the right-hand side of our inequality, the maximal value as h gets smaller also kind of gets crunched to the y value f of x. So by the squeeze theorem, we have that the derivative of g must be equal to f of x. And that essentially just completes the proof of the first part for us. Now that I know g is a differentiable function um, and g's derivative is f of x, the continuity of g basically comes from the fact that it's differentiable. So we've done all the three things we need to do. We started um, essentially by just kind of proving that this function's derivative is equal to f of x. We know that g is indeed going to be differentiable then because we've shown that it has a derivative. Its derivative is equal to f of x. And, um, and like I said, and now that I know that g is differentiable, I know that g has to be continuous on the interval that we're working on as well. So all three of these things are done. That is a full and complete proof of the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So how, how do you feel? Do you feel smarter now? Do you feel like you could have done that? And I, I never feel like I can prove the fundamental theorem of calculus part one on my own. The first part I find a little bit challenging. Um, the second part is actually a fair amount easier uh, than the first part to prove. So that's what we're going to be doing next, is we're going to bounce over to the statement of the second part of the fundamental theorem and try to prove this one. And the nice thing about doing the hard proof first is that now we can actually use some of the concepts from that first proof inside of this second proof. So the statement of the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says the following. It says f is a continuous function on our closed interval. Um, we're also going to assume that capital F is really any antiderivative of little f. And then our goal in the second part of the fundamental theorem is to show that if I want to calculate the area bounded, or the net area bounded between f of x and the x-axis, I can find any antiderivative capital F evaluated at the upper and lower bounds and then take a difference like this. So we want to show that this equality actually holds true. So that's our goal. And once we kind of get off to the races here, it's, it's not too challenging to get this one going. So once we start it, you might even be able to kind of see how it works. Um, to start, what we're going to do is we're going to jump back and we're going to utilize the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. So in other words, we're going to uh, define a function. We're going to call that function g of x, and we're going to define it as the antiderivative of f. Okay, so let's define that function as an antiderivative. Of course, we know um, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one. we know that the derivative of this function is indeed f of x. So in other words, I, I know for sure that g has to be an antiderivative of f. So one other kind of important concept that we talked about uh, a little bit earlier in the course was antiderivatives differ from each other by at most a constant.
you know, in other words, if I take the derivative of g and I take the derivative of capital F, both of them should give me small, like little f. They should give me a lowercase f. So in other words, the slope of both g and capital F at any x value has to be the same. And the only way for that to happen is if the difference uh, between these two functions is at most a constant number. So we're going to utilize that fact and we're going to set up an equation between g and f. We're going to say that um, capital F of x uh, must be equal to g of x, but maybe they differ by a constant number. So this c is just any real number. Okay, now that we have all of the, the building blocks that we need, we can actually set up and uh, prove this particular equality right here. So we're going to get set up to prove this particular equality by actually starting with the right-hand side first. Okay, so let's kind of think about what is capital F at B minus capital F at A. Well, capital F is equivalent to G of X plus C. So F evaluated at B must be G evaluated at B plus some constant number. So there is F evaluated at B. And F evaluated at A is going to look very similar. It's going to be G evaluated at A plus C. All right, so here's F of B. And this expression over here is F evaluated at A. I'm just, um, I guess, replacing F with an expression that involves G. And that's because we kind of know what G looks like. So it makes more sense to, to talk about the little g function because I know it's somehow related to F through this integral. Um, it's a little bit easier to talk about G than it is to talk about capital F. So when we go to actually remove these square brackets that I've put in, the capital C's will effectively cancel. They're going to be subtracted from one another. We're going to get zero. So we have g of b minus g at a. Okay, so now our goal is to kind of look at how do I convert this into uh, something that has a lowercase f in it. So I'm just going to write down uh, how we defined g. So we said g was equal to an integral function from a to x of f. So g evaluated at b must be the integral from a to b of f. And g evaluated at a must be the integral from a to a of f. Okay, so I'm just using this fact. I'm just using how I defined g. And an interesting thing happens once I make this substitution. I realize that this is one of the properties of integrals that we have. This is actually equal to zero. So this is the net area between f and the x-axis evaluated between a and a, but there's really no area there. So that tends towards zero, or that is zero. And we're left with the integral from a to b of f of t dt. So exactly the thing that we wanted to show. Um, we've shown that capital F evaluated at B minus capital F evaluated at A is equal to this integral. And remember, T here is a dummy variable, so I could replace it. Um, now that I don't have X inside the bounds, I could replace that T now with an X. And we've shown the thing that we need to, uh, where capital F is any antiderivative of small f. So two very interesting and powerful theorems here. The first one, uh, the first part of the FTC is saying that if I take the derivative of the antiderivative, I should get the original function back, so giving us the relationship between derivatives and antiderivatives. And then the second part here that we just proved, uh, uh, helping us solve the area problem. So if I'm curious about the net area between f and the x-axis, between some bounds, all I really need to do is find an antiderivative and evaluate that antiderivative at two endpoints. Now remember, capital F can be any antiderivative, and it's often beneficial for us to take the area function, the one where C, capital C, is actually equal to zero. That's the easiest one for us to pick, typically, when using the fundamental theorem part two. So those are the proofs of the theorems. That's the class for today. Uh, have a lovely weekend, guys, and I will see all of you next week.